chaos, and this chaos gave birth spontaneously of itself, of its own accord, so we do have a precedent for the self-organizing myth in the Western tradition, uh, to Gaia, the Earth goddess. And she gave birth spontaneously to Uranus, who lay on top of her, and they mated, and within her womb began to fill up these horrible monsters, the Titans and the Cyclops and so forth. And they horrified Uranus, and he didn't want to let them out. So Gaia enlists the aid of her son Saturn. She hands him a sickle, and he comes in and slices off the genitals of Uranus. And that separates, that's the separation motif of the heaven and the earth, and casts the genitals into the ocean, and they foam up and upspring Aphrodite here. She is the goddess of the genitals. This is what mythological images are. They are personifications of the energies of the organs of the body. Mars is the personification of aggression. Jupiter is the personification of jovial benevolence and good-natured humor. When the Egyptians mummified bodies, by the way, they would pull out all the organs, except for the heart, because they didn't need that for the day of judgment. And in canopic jars, they put each of the different organs and on each of these canopic jars with a different thought, the Egyptians recognized that the images of myth are produced from out of the body. And these images are pictorial visualizations to the waking mind of the organs of the body and their various impulses. And so that's uh, uh, Hesiod's Theogony. And then uh, Saturn is now king with Rhea, his wife, and they mate and begin producing all these other gods. And um, Saturn has heard that Zeus will come and displace him. So he begins devouring all of his children. Here is uh, the image of Saturn devouring his children. And he begins trying to swallow them all up. You can barely see that. And um, Rhea, meanwhile, has the wit to take the infant Zeus, wrap him up, and has him, takes him to the island of Crete where he is nursed. And she wraps a stone in the blanket and gives it to Saturn, and he mistakes that for Zeus, gobbles it up. And when Zeus comes of age, he comes back to his father Saturn, slices his belly open, and outsprings all the gods that he's been devouring, like the red riding thing. And uh, that's as far as I want to go with Hesiod's Theogony, but I just want to convey the sense that this is quite consistent with the other myths, the motif of the separation, for example. And the Hesiodic myth is also consistent with the Egyptian and Hindu myths of the universe spontaneously self-organized. You have the patriarchal gods coming in later on and fighting amongst each other, slaying dragons and so forth, because that's the Greeks giving recognition to the mother goddess societies which they conquered and put down, and the patriarchal warriors were from a secondary epoch. Myths resolve the energies that are taking place historically. All the various tensions are encoded. So you can crack open a myth and find the entire history of human culture in it if you know how to read the myth as well as the history of evolution. These primordial energies, the sexual impulse, the consuming impulse, are all sprung in here in coded imagistic form. Now I just want to conclude here with uh, then the image of the Big Bang. Now the, uh, the Big Bang was actually first proposed by a Catholic priest, the Abbe Georges Lemaitre, who proposed this idea that the universe started as a kind of cosmic egg, a primordial atom that was just sitting there, like the self in the Hindu myth, for who knows how long, just sitting there. And it was perfectly balanced by an attractive force and a repulsive force. But for some reason, and Lemaitre doesn't speculate on how, he just says there was this sudden asymmetry whereby the repulsive force dominated over the attractive force, and the thing blew up, and it exploded. And uh, this is all mapped out in terms of milli milliseconds and millions of seconds. And up here we have enormous temperatures, trillions and trillions of degrees of temperature here, and here are the milliseconds. In the first 10 to the negative 43rd of a second, you have this subatomic wash of particles, quarks, and anti-quarks, neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, and electrons and positrons, and then light particles. Now, this is a mythological motif. The particles 
are doing war with the antiparticles. They're slamming into each other and wiping each other out. In the old Scandinavian vision of the end of the universe, the day of Ragnarok, Wotan and all the gods will equally match up and line up with their anti-gods, the Titans, and they will do battle to the death. This is the ending of Beowulf, actually, it's, which is related to that whole Scandinavian mythos, where he goes out to his, the day of his death and he fights the dragon, and he kills the dragon, but the dragon also kills him. These pairs of opposites line up and wipe each other out. So that's a mythological motif. But there is a slight, slight asymmetry here again. For every billion particles of antimatter, there is, for some mysterious reason, a billion plus one particles of matter. So as they're wiping each other out, one quark survives from a quark and anti. You have one quark and an anti-quark slamming into each other, but one quark survives. Because of this asymmetry, matter survived this initial annihilation. And for every billion particles of light, there is one particle of matter. So matter is really a kind of shadow in a world made mostly of light. So we have this primordial opposition of light and darkness here, right in the Big Bang. Then, then as we move here, as the seconds begin to move over into this epoch, there's a cooling, the temperature starts dropping, and the universe begins to expand to about the size of the solar system at this point. And these forms begin to kind of crease now. Quarks begin lining up with each other, and it takes three quarks to make a proton and three to make a neutron. And the strong force glues them together. Strong force is called muons. They, they hold the quarks together. And matter begins to kind of crease out of this. So you have these protons. And a proton is a hydrogen nucleus. That's all it is. So a hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron. So already we have the hydrogen nucleus formed here. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It's the first element on the periodic table of elements. And something like 99% of the visible matter in the cosmos is composed of hydrogen and helium. Helium is the second thing that forms here. Here are helium particles. Helium is made out of two protons and two neutrons, which begin grouping together. And 99% of the visible matter of the universe is made out of hydrogen and helium. And that's interesting because when we look inside the chemical makeup of the human body, let's say if we go into the DNA and open that up, we find these four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. And within them, the chemical structure there of each one of those is hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. That hydrogen was manufactured in the Big Bang. No more hydrogen was manufactured. We contain elements within our bodies from the Big Bang. Not only that, but when stars begin to form, what stars do is they use hydrogen as fuel. Once all the hydrogen has been created, and here we move to this point where the actual atoms come in and the electrons start getting locked into the orbits of helium and of hydrogen, then you start getting hydrogen atoms and helium atoms. Now you have the basic fuel for the creation of stars, because all stars require is gravity and hydrogen. And what is going on in our sun right now is this nucleosynthesis of hydrogen that is slamming together to form helium. It's making helium right now. That's its fuel. When it exhausts that supply, it will start smashing the helium together to form carbon. And after that, it will start smashing the carbon together to form nitrogen and oxygen up to iron. And at that point, depending on the mass and density of the star, some stars explode, some don't. If the star should explode and go supernova, all the other heavier elements will be synthesized instantaneously on the periodic table of elements. And space is seeded with all of these fundamental elements from which our bodies have been made. The nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen, along with the hydrogen in our bodies, have been made in outer space. And so, the old Gnostic myths are in fact true, that we are beings descended from the heavens. There is a truth to that myth, that myth, that the soul's true home is in the heavens and it is trapped in a material body. That's one way of expressing that these stars have manufactured the basic chemical elements that are within us. 